Okay, hello. Welcome to this interesting. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, are there questions about anything that's been happening so far before I start talking about this reading for good news? Now do you actually have any hair? Uh, well, right, so in this reading, Goodman moves from discussing projection. Session induction. Although, like, it turns out that they're the same thing, according to him. <laughs> but it seems like we're taking up a new subject. So, like, um, to use the rubber example, um, we want to use the fact that a certain piece of rubber is now bending under suitable pressure, that is, is flexing, as evidence that um, all pieces of rubber will bend under, under suitable pressure. Um, we want to um, we want to build up evidence for that um, hypothesis, and by building up evidence for it, we at least to some extent adopt or accept that hypothesis which means that uh, we make predictions on the basis of that hypothesis for like what will happen in the future. So I say, you know, like, oh, there's that piece of rubber over there. I predict that if I put it under suitable pressure, it will bend. So, um, and so that like question about induction is how can that be justified? At least that's what you would think the question about induction is. How can that be justified? Right? Just because this piece of rubber is bending under suitable pressure, why does that license me to predict that that other piece of rubber will be under suitable pressure? So, um, so Grimman says, like, starts his discussion of induction by saying, well, however it is that that's going to be justified, it's not going to be by showing that those predictions are true. Because we don't know if they're true. <laughs> right, this is what he says on page uh, 62. Um, now, obviously, the genuine problem cannot be one of attaining unattainable knowledge or of accounting for knowledge that we do not, in fact, have. Since we don't know whether that piece of rubber will bend because we, it's in the future, how do we know? That's what he's saying. So we don't know, so we can't explain how we know because we, we don't. So what is the problem then? Well, um, and this is, you know, should start to sound similar to the, to the, to the question about dispositional predicates and manifest predicates. That's going to be the connection is we want to give necessary and sufficient conditions, um, for, for making that prediction. So we want to say under what conditions uh, do we say that that piece of rubber will bend with under suitable pressure? Okay, so um, uh, so in other words, and we want to give conditions in terms of the knowledge that we do have. So we want to so we want to say on the basis of the things that we know about what we're seeing, like for example, that this piece of rubber is bending, what predictions are valid 
like inductively valid and which are not. But again, the answer is not going to tell us what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> the answer is just going to tell us whether it was a good inductive prediction. Or not. Now, you might ask, hold on a second, don't we? Uh, um, don't we rely on the prediction, inductive prediction? Don't we like isn't and so well so the first answer would be like well okay yes we rely on do we know that that would be the right thing to do I mean do we know that our reliance will not be disappointed no we don't because we don't know what's going to happen <laughs> but still you might ask but wait isn't it kind of like reasonable to rely on and unreasonable not to rely on So Goodman says, um, he compares this to the case with principles of deduction. And he says, this is on page 63 near the bottom, principles of deductive inference are justified by their conformity with accepted deductive pra practice. Their validity depends on accordance with the particular deductive inferences we actually make and sanction. If a rule yields unacceptable inferences, we drop it as invalid. So the point is that, um, yeah, there just are some inductive inferences we treat as valid and some we treat as invalid. And if you ask, why is it reasonable to rely on the valid ones and not the invalid ones? That's basically like the definition of reasonable, that you rely on valid inferences and not invalid ones. So it's, um, um, and by the way, when you say their validity depends upon, a, according with the particular deductive inferences we actually make and sanction who is we so it's presumably not everyone right like i'm you know in fact from goodman's point of view it may not be very many people <laughs> right? I mean, given the way he talks about even other philosophers <laughs> and then perhaps invalid deductive inferences they've accepted <laughs> So we is like people with a good logical conscience, so to speak, <laughs> right? Like, so, um, so the way this answers the question, why is it reasonable to predict that all rubber will bend, given that all the rubber so far has been under suitable pressure, but, um, somehow not a very satisfying answer. Um, but, um, but Goodman says, this is the only kind of answer that makes sense to give. And this is the kind of answer that Hume gave. And right, it is when Hume asked about induction, well, Hume sort of asked about induction, but let's say when Hume asked, I mean, among other things, I guess he asked about induction. So when, when Hume asked about induction, you know, like, um, at least this is what Goodman thinks Hume asked about induction. So we're seeing a number of different Humes in this class. <laughs> We're, we're going to see a number of different humes. This is one hume. Uh, Quine is going to have a different hume. Copper is going to have a different hume. <laughs> so anyway, when Goodman's hume asked about induction is Goodman's question. Like, what characterizes the inductive inferences that we make and rely on and consider reasonable? What's the difference between them and the other? And according to Goodman, Hume's answer was, well, it's the ones we're in the habit of expecting something like that to happen. 
right? And so Goodman says, well, I don't think that answer is exactly right, but it's the right kind of answer. And he, um, makes fun of people who, who wanted more from him or who thought that, Hume, that that answer left some big problem over that Hume couldn't solve. I mean, I guess there's, there's two different versions of it. One is saying Hume like, didn't notice that this was a bad solution. And another would be saying, obviously Hume couldn't have failed to notice that. So therefore Hume himself must not be satisfied with the solution. But either one of those, Goodman says, is um, an underestimate of Hume, basically. And he calls Hume the greatest of modern philosophers. So that's kind of like, I guess, for one thing, pointedly ruling out Kant as the greatest of modern philosophers, <laughs> or Descartes for that matter. Right? It's a, um, he's, right, he's declaring, what tradition he's part of. And, he, and, and he's saying that uh, people, I guess saying the people within that tradition have been guilty of underestimating their great uh, predecessor. He, um, in fact, he's, they've, they've become smug, as he calls it. This is on page 64. It says there's like a smug tradition of thinking that we know better than Hume. But he says, or, or thinking that we, there's a problem that Hume left over that we could solve. But really, uh, even though Hume's answer can be fixed in various ways, there's no like further type of question can left over. Now, I mean, and there's a couple of things to say about that. But one is that as an interpretation of Hume, this is kind of worrying because the truth is Hume does not seem very satisfied, <laughs> right? Like, the, well, I mean, I guess it's a little bit different in the um, treatise as opposed to in the first inquiry, but, uh, but certainly at the end of book one of the treatise, Hume um, sounds bewildered, right? He says, well, I don't know if you guys have read this or not, Taking one hundred two. Yeah. 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 So if you took it with me, you then you remember me talking about this part where Hume says, like, you know, uh, you know, although I started off confident, now I kind of now I feel like I'm isolated and you know, right. So I mean, so so Hume at least at some moment is does not seem to agree with Goodman that this all, you know, okay, this problem is solved. <laughs> um, but, and I guess the other thing to say about this from a, is that from a political point of view, this, this sounds similar to, now again, I don't know much about Goodman's politics. I don't know anything about it really. I know more about Klein's politics, um, but, um, but it certainly sounds like a kind of um, uh, conservative reaction to liberal tradition that started off right about this time <laughs> in the 50s, right? So it's like, you know, uh, using the, the more distant past as a weapon against the more recent past and calling it a smug establishment that needs to be taken down. <laughs> right. So, um, so there, uh, so I feel like that's not a coincidence, even like whatever Goodman's particular politics are, it's not a coincidence that that kind of move is being made here. All right. That's probably, well, I don't know. That's maybe more than I should have said about Hume. It seems like Goodman thinks it's important, though. I mean, he doesn't spend a long time talking about it, but it's like, it seems like it's an important point for him to say, you know. So I'm going to stop there.
something about what you meant and how it's been received and so forth. In any case, getting on to what, to what Goodman thinks, because as I said, Goodman thinks Hume's, Goodman's Hume's solution is in the right direction, but he's not going to give exactly that solution. He's going to give a different kind of solution. Um, um, and so the solution he's looking for is like a general solution would tell us how to translate predictions into non predictions. It's just like a general uh, solution to the problem about dispositional predicates it would tell us how to translate dispositional propositions into manifest propositions. Right? So the idea is that we're going to be able to translate you know, the prediction, um, well, I guess maybe I should, all pieces of rubber. Um, and future. Flex. Uh, that is, or that is, when when put under suitable pressure in the future, they will bend. We want to translate this into a statement about the pieces of rubber that have actually already been that has already been put under suitable pressure. Um. So in other words, this predicate here, will flex, is basically like unacceptable. We want to eliminate it in favor of an uh, acceptable, acceptable um, predicate what is or was flex. And uh, and the way we're going to do that is the same way we did it before with flex is flexing and flexible. We're going to try to find some acceptable predicate that's the same as this in the realm where it applies. And then we're going to define the unacceptable predicate using that acceptable predicate. So the acceptable predicate, like this is the thing that we called A before. So that the acceptable predicate, let's say, is going to be something like Is rubber or imagine it being a list of all things that, um, whenever they have been examined so far, have been found to be flexible? All the types of things, right? So, like, is rubber or plastic or whatever? <laughs> so, um, um, so, what we're going to do is um, so again, like in the realm of things that have already been examined so far, here is the realm of things that are or were flexing when examined in the past or the present. We want to extend it to a predicate. Which, I mean, I guess really you could call it is or was flexing or will flex, <laughs> right? That is a predicate that includes both this and future cases. We want to extend it to this. And how do we do that? What we find in the, in the realm of the cases that are already examined, this goes together with A. Right? So all and only the things that have already been examined that are that were A. Um, flexed, that is bent under suitable pressure. 
And so, uh, so we're just going to define the new predicate is or was flexing or will flex as A. Remember, A is something like is rubber or blah, blah, blah. So this sentence, a piece, all pieces of rubber when examined in the future will flex, translates into all pieces of rubber when examined in the future will be rubber or blah, 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 blah. <laughs> which is true. <laughs> so it's good. <laughs> yeah. So you just kind of redefine the predicate as like the uh, adjective itself. In this case, like rubber itself is inherently flex, is, was, or will flex, and that's just okay. Well, it's, I mean, so like, honestly, it doesn't have to be that simple, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it could go by means of some complicated molecular description that rubber and other things also fit. Right? It doesn't only A just has to be something that goes together with the manifest predicate in the realm of things that are have already been examined, whatever that may be. So, you know, but uh, but yeah, a simple way to do that would be you just to just pull put in all the types of things that so far have been found to, to bend under suitable pressure. And um and I mean, even though the result, like it does seem almost like a joke, you know. So it's like, yes, this is this is true because it translates into all pieces of rubber will be rubber. <laughs> um, I think this is actually the best kind of example to look at because um, this is. Um, Um, this is the way every hypothesis is going to turn out to be a question about projecting a predicate, right? So, like, every time I have a hypothesis, like, all A will be B. I move to translate that into, you know, all A is A or um, and um, and now the question going forward will be right because so. Remember, this is like at least we're thinking of it. This 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 is the future here. So like someday the future will be the present, right? So like we go into the future and um, now take something that's a in what used to be the future, but now it's the present, um, and see if it's b. So for example, in this case. You know, like tomorrow we take a piece of rubber that hasn't been examined yet, we'll put it under suitable pressure, and then we would bend or it won't bend. So if it doesn't bend, what will that mean? Was our definition wrong? Well, a definition can't really be wrong, right? I mean, you can define your words how you want, but it will turn out to have not been well motivated. It doesn't do what we want it to do, right? Because now um, um, our statement that we made yesterday, um, all rubber will flex when examined in the future, means all rubber is rubber, so it's true. But meanwhile, you know, um, um, in, in, the, in the new present, uh, we don't actually want to say that this rubber is flexible. 
So, right, so maybe I should have started with if it works for us, like, but anyway, I mean, right, because if we found, if, if in the future, you know, now present, we find that the rubber does bend under suitable pressure, then we say, oh, good, this translation worked, right? But as it translates everything we say, I mean, let me start, let me start over again. The point of translation is to, of this type of translation, is to preserve the truth conditions. So there's something that we said before that we went around saying, all pieces of rubber when examined in the future will, will flex. So, um, and the idea of this translation is to capture the truth conditions of this statement. Right, so we want this, the translation to be true just when we would say that the, the original statement is true. If it doesn't, then we say, well, that translation, like, we don't, we don't like that translation. We can't use that translation because we, we can't accept it because um, it, um, There's some cases where we want to say this is true and we want to say that's false. So we don't want to use this translation. So, right, so, so, so I guess this is the way to put it. So if we, if tomorrow we take this piece of bread and put it under suitable pressure and it doesn't bend, then looking back at the original statement, we'll say it was false. Right? They'll say yesterday when we said all pieces of rubber when examined will bend, will flex, we were wrong. Because look, here's one that's not flexing. But on the other hand, looking back at the translation, we'll say, oh yeah, that was true. When we said all, all pieces of rubber are rubber yesterday, that was true. Right? So in the future, looking back, we'll say, no, we did capture the truth conditions. And so we'll be forced to abandon this translation. Whereas if in the future, um, it, like, it turns out that the rubber does bend, we'll, we'll look back and we'll say, oh yeah, this was true and this was true. So it was a good translation. So that's what testing a hypothesis is from the point of view that Goodman is taking. Testing a hypothesis is testing whether the translation you proposed yesterday um, was actually good. <laughs> In other words, proposing that rubber is part of the definition of will flex is like, betting um, that looking back from the future, you'll say that when I said rubber will flex yesterday, I'll say that that was true. So, um, so this putting rubber into the definition of will flex is a way of like adopting the hypothesis that rubber will flex. I don't know if I can make that any clearer. A lot of people are not looking happy about this. <laughs> it's a weird, like it's 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 a weird, like backwards, inside out way of looking at what we're doing here. <laughs> um, but it's the way Goodman thinks we need to, to think about it to avoid um, claiming to know something that we don't, namely what will happen in the future. <laughs> so we need to think about it as like when I say in the future all rubber will bend under suitable pressure. What I mean is that, um, in part, I'm like I'm, I'm allowing myself now to say, "Will bond depend under suitable pressure of something if it's wrong?" 
right? I'm like, and that, that's the translation or definition, right? I'm, I'm making my statement will bend under suitable pressure, like partly a, a translation of is rubber. That's what I mean when I say all rubber will bend under suitable pressure in the future. Yeah. So like theoretically, if I went up and I applied simple pressure and the rubber didn't bend, then I wouldn't be justified in saying this isn't rubber, but I'd have to go back and change my prediction of what makes something rubber or what makes. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, we're leaving out, I'm leaving out a lot of complications here. Like what will happen when, you know, tomorrow I take what I thought was a piece of rubber and it doesn't bend. Will I say rubber isn't flexible, or will I say that wasn't rubber? I mean, that probably depends on a lot of things, you know. Um, and 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 all those things are important. But but for the for the moment, I'm just saying you that rubber is a manifest predicate, right? Meaning that there's no problem. It's acceptable. There's no problem about deciding whether things are rubber or not. So I mean, Goodman himself admits that that's like somehow for the purposes of argument or it depends on a choice of system or something like that. So, you know, so assuming that there's no problem about whether something is rubber or not, but, you know, but the question is what, the question is whether it will flex or not in the future, right? And, the, and, and again, but so like, since um, I can't really justifiably assert something about the future, what, what I'm doing when I say it will flex is I'm saying that, like, yeah, again, the best I can put it is like I'm allowing myself to say of something that it will flex on the condition that it's rubber. Um, um, and I'm doing that because. You know, I'm, or the fact that I'm doing, I'm not sure whether the right, what the right way to put this, but like the fact that I'm doing that is, yeah. I'm doing that because rubber, I mean, say it would, like it would be easier to understand to think if rubber was the only thing that's flexible. So, right, like I said before, like if rubber is the only thing that's flexible. So, I'm, you know, I'm doing that because I find that calling something rubber really is the same as saying that it bends under suitable pressure, you know, in all the cases that have already been examined. Those two really are equivalent. So um, now I'm just saying, okay, when I want to extend this predicate beyond what I'm justified in doing, what I'll do is just identify it with rubber. So when I say all rubber will flex in the future, now I really just mean all rubber will be rubber in the future. Um, okay. Um, so, you know, there's a small correction to this, which is um, important from some point of view, but it's kind of confusing, but it's the, the fact that as Goodman um, points out, uh, induction isn't all about the future, right? This is on page uh, 90. Um, when all the undetermined cases of a hypothesis are future cases, its projection is a prediction. Very often, however, undetermined cases may be past cases. And here we have a projection that, projection, projection that is not a prediction, right? So the point is that like, it's not only the future, there's other rubber that, you know, in the present somewhere is put under suitable pressure, but we don't know if it's bent or not because it like we haven't examined the results yet. You know, so it may be in the present or even in the past. Um, um, but you know uh, um, like we put it straight into the box yesterday and we applied suitable pressure but we haven't opened the box yet. 
So it either, you know, is flexing or it isn't, but we don't know which. So, I mean, we're really going to find out which in the future. You know, as, as uh, Bridget says, obviously, everything we learn in the future, we'll, we'll learn in the future. <laughs> but part of what we're learning about is, is sometimes things that already have happened. Um, like I said, that's, that's kind of important, but um, I mean, I think it, it's important because it shows from Bridget's point of view that induction is not really a special case of this projection problem. But it's really just exactly the same thing. And any um, statement, like uh, any hypothesis, like all emeralds are green, so like. Um, so this is an example of a hypothesis that you know certain cases have been determined. We've looked at certain emeralds and saw that they were green, and other cases remain undetermined. I don't. I think some emeralds are not green actually. Right. All right. So um, let's assume that all of us that have examined so far were green. So. Um, so some cases have been determined, and some cases haven't been determined. Well, so you can understand green to me some to mean something like green seeable, right? Like if it were seen, it would look green. So this, you know, really all any predicate like this can be understood as a dispositional predicate in this problem of projection that is. Again, because it's not just about the future, but it's about all the unexamined cases. It's really basically just the same as the problem of rejecting dispositional predicates. That's what Goodman says. Anyway. Are there questions about any of that? Did the people who felt really unhappy before feel a little bit happier now? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, right. Um, now, I mean, there's also a, a confusing thing, and which I would rather not talk about it, but I feel like I have to say something about it because so, so like what gets projected. Um, so in chapter two on dispositional predicates. It mostly seems like the manifest predicate gets projected into or onto the dispositional predicate. So what's projected is a predicate, and what's and it's and what's projected is a manifest predicate, and it's projected out to a dispositional predicate. In the later chapter, it starts first of all sometimes talking about the dispositional predicate being projected. Right, so like green. Right, so like in chapter three and chapter four, he's going to ask, like, what makes green projectable? What makes the predicate green projectable? So the predicate green is, is the dispositional predicate in this picture, not the manifest predicate. So it's so now we're talking something it's like um, it's kind of like projected out of the manifest predicate. So, so that's one ambiguity in what he calls projected, and therefore what can be projectable or not projectable. And also, sometimes he talks about a, a, a hypothesis being projectable or not projectable. As he says in the footnote somehow, somewhere, basically, it's, you know, the hypothesis is projectable it means the same thing as the predicate of the hypothesis is projectable. Okay. So, um,
So, you know, so this is supposed to, aside from some technical details, which he alludes to briefly, like the Vedas paradox and whatever, this is, but which he thinks can be taken care of by technical means. Um, this basically is supposed to finish solving Hume's question about induction. This is the answer. Induction is projection. The projection uh, is, you know, a way of uh, translating inacceptable predicates into acceptable predicates. And, you know, you can work on exactly the conditions, like, you know, exactly how to do that. But, um, but that answers the question, what justifies inductive inferences? But unfortunately, it leaves behind another question. Which and this is where Goodman introduces his famous predicate three. So, uh, so the definition of group. So first of all, it contains a time t, which is not specified, but which is supposed to be some time that hasn't come yet. Uh, so, yeah, call it the year 2023, right? <laughs> yeah. But really, it's, you know, it's just some time that hasn't come yet. And we define Gru as, so there's two parts to the definition. It's something is Gru if it's either and first examine before T or blue and not examine before T. And there's also an analogous predicate green with green and blue switched here. Right? So green means either blue and first examined before T or green and not examined before T. So green, and so by the way, this is the way Goodman defines green. A lot of later people define green in a different way. Putnam alludes to this in his uh in his introduction or preface or that stuff. Um, and actually Putnam says, and yeah, the, the other definition is easier. It serves to make the same points. But I don't think the other definition is at all the same from Goodman's point of view. Right? So that because the way you the way you'll sometimes see it grew defined as green before T or blue after T. So this makes a big difference. So, like according to Goodman's definition, um, nothing changes color at time t. Nothing changes from green to blue or from blue to blue at time t, right? So let's say we have an emerald that we've already looked at before time t, and we found that it was green. So, um, it's definitely group. We don't have to wait till time t to find out if it's group, right? Because it's green and it was first examined before time t. It's, so, it's green now and it will be green after time t. And it's grew now and it will still be grew after time t. Right, because after time t, it will still be green and it will still have first been examined before time t. Um, on the other hand, if you take a dime, a, um, an emerald that's still in the ground, that's never been examined, and suppose it's not going to be examined until after time t. 
So uh, for it to be groove, it's going to have to be blue. So it's already blue. Right? It's blue now. Right? It's already blue because it's it's already not examined before time t. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be examined before time t. Right? So the whole time before time t, it's not examined before time t, and it's blue. And then after time t, when it's examined, it's still not examined before time t, and it's still blue. So it was blue before when it was in the ground, and it's blue when we take it out after time t, and it stays blue, and it also stays blue. It was always blue, and then it will always be blue. Um, so this isn't a, so, so like nothing happens at time t. Nothing happens to emeralds at time t. Something happens to like our experience of emeralds at time t. The new ones we examine now are blue. They were always blue, but we just didn't examine them. <laughs> okay, so that's the definition of groove. And then the question is, um, okay, so now it's before time t, and we've examined lots of elements, and they were all green. Again, I'm not sure that's really true. I think maybe not all of them are green, but that's the sake of our channel. Let's assume they were all green. So um, we've examined all these emeralds so far, and they're all green. So a valid inductive inference is all emeralds um, are green, meaning all emeralds that whenever they're examined will be found to be green. But um, also all the emeralds we've examined so far are green. They're definitely green. Right again, that's why this this version of the definition is important because the other definition of the, the other version of the definition, we don't know if the emeralds we've examined so far are grew or not, right? They would have to turn blue at time t, and time t hasn't arrived yet. So we know they're green, but we don't know if they're grew. But according to Goodman's original definition, every time we find an emerald before time t and it's green, we also know it's blue. So grew is like, so to speak, just as manifest as green. Neither of them are completely manifest because green means like green seeable and grew means like grew seeable, right? So, but um, but for the cases we've examined, we know exactly which ones are green, namely all of them, and we know that they're all grew also. So the question is, why is it? All emeralds are grew, also a valid inductive conclusion. I mean, all the emeralds we found so far were grew. Yeah. It, it just seems kind of imprecise. Like, it doesn't really have like a representable meaning. Like, if you told me to draw a grew, like pick the grew crayon, like it wouldn't be possible. Um, actually, it would be, but yeah, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be specific to like any one object. I feel like I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, like of all the things you've seen, you you can you can see now and until time t, uh, you know exactly which ones are true. Yeah. This is like only like the definition. Yeah. You can have the for the second part yet. Well, so it you know um, it depends how you write the hypothesis. You know, I mean, if if you translate it into blue and green, then it has two parts. And if you can leave it as blue, it only has one part. And as Goodman points out, um, and this is why it's important to define gleam as well as blue. You can define green as green 
or C or D. Right? This is a perfectly good definition of green because, you know, if something, everything that's green, that was first examined before it can't be is green. And everything that's green and that's not examined before it can't be is green. But now this has two parts. And you only have evidence for this part, not for this part. <laughs> so green has the same problem as group. So, um, uh, so what this shows, as Goodman puts it, is that there's no syntactic criterion. You can't tell by examining how the sentence is written out whether it's uh, you know. Um, projectable hypothesis or not. Because you can, because you can, you know, like if you say, oh, it can't have two parts like this, or it can't refer to a specific time, that's another possible solution that he, that he mentions, right? Maybe you're not allowed to use predicates to refer to a specific time. So like, um, you can write all animals are green in a way that has two parts and it refers to a specific time. So, um, so it's, it must be something about the predicate, the meaning of the predicates green and brew. But you can't tell just from examining the sense somehow you have to know what these predicates are, and somehow you can tell which one is projectable and which one is not. Um, and another way to put the same thing from Carnap's point of view, would be to say that um, for me it's not exactly the same thing, but it, it, it is to show what a big problem this is for, for any verification theory of meaning. Um, so like GRU is defined in terms of green and blue. So like it can be constructed on the basis of green and blue, right? This is this is a limited definition. So the whole idea behind Carnap's procedure and the procedure of the logical causes in general is we start off with some predicates that we definitely know how to apply, right? Like immediate empirical predicates, something like that, and then like using the logical forms of definition and you build up other predicates and like empirical meaningfulness gets transmitted up to those new predicates because they're eliminable in terms of the whole predicates. So, um, so if these are empirically meaningful, then this is empirically meaningful. And that's supposed to guarantee that the things you say with the new predicates are empirically, the, the, the propositions you express with the new predicates are empirically meaningful, meaning that you can build up empirical evidence for or against them. That's how the project is supposed to work. And then, you know, there's certain like relaxation of it or whatever, but you don't need any relaxation in this case. It's like, it's, I mean, you don't even need definition in use. This is like a perfectly straightforward definition, right? Well, I mean, there may be some problem about the T part, but I, I, um, I don't think it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, T could be specified by the, to the subject A in terms of something that happened in, in A's experience. So, um, and yet the problem is that although 
uh, we can build up evidence that all animals are green. There's no way of gathering evidence that all animals are green. What, I mean, when I say there's no way, I mean, like in goodness terms, like there's nothing we actually would accept as evidence for that in four times T. Right, because everything that looks like it could be evidence for that will say no, it's evidence that animals are green. It's green. <laughs> right? We won't take that as evidence that animals are green. So so this statement, even though it contains only fragments that should be empirically meaningful according to logical positivists, the statement itself is not empirically meaningful, at least not before time t. That is, um, again, it doesn't prescribe a task of verifying or falsifying things. It doesn't tell us what to do. It doesn't tell us what we're responsible for when we assert it. So, I mean, I think this is why, like, like, even though he said it before he posed this problem, I think this is why Goodman is so sure that the tragic history of the verification theory of meaning is um, tragic and over, <laughs> right? Because he's, because, like, this seems to me that there's just no way you could use verifiability as the way to distinguish um, acceptable from unacceptable concepts. Rue is not an acceptable concept, concept but it's perfectly verifiable <laughs> in, the, in, in the way that the positivists mean that. Um, So, you know, so how can you solve this? Like, I mean, so a, a couple of people already gave suggestions that are similar to suggestions that people made in response to this problem when Goodman first raised it. So he first raised some version of it in 1947. Um, actually, I guess Carnap responded in 1947. I don't remember. I think his original paper was also 1947. So by the time he, he wrote this or gave these lectures, he's already had some experience with people responding to it. He lists various responses and says why they won't work. Um, so the, you know, like for example, saying that you can you can tell that a predicate is no good if it refers to a specific time or place. That's you know, that's what this is supposed to show will not work. Um, so a different response and Basically, Carnap tried something like that in response to Goodman, would be to say, um, look, green is a real property that things can have, and blue is not. <laughs> green is a natural property, right? Green is a true universal. I mean, you can, for the fact that Carnap like, was interested in saying anything like this, you can tell because this is not the type of thing Carnap would want to say, but he'll say it if he's pushed <laughs> to the wall, right? Say, yeah, look, somehow, you know, we know that some predicates are, uh, you know, really express properties of the world that we can experience and others don't. Um, and green is one of them, and blue is not, or at least not as much. <laughs> right? I mean, <clears throat> to say that green is a natural property of things, it's a little bit. Um, it's not like like electric charge or something. It's not a fundamental physical property. 
it's, you know, different things are green for all kinds of different reasons. It's, and, and, and moreover, I mean, if it means that we see something as green, which I guess is what it should mean, then, uh, yeah, but the way we, our eyes respond to light is really complicated. All of this is by way of saying that, that all the things that, that we say are green, like don't necessarily have any kind of really simple natural property in common with each other. Yeah. I have a question about this thought experiment. What instead of like having the four sheet, you have either green or blue and non or red and non or yellow and non it's had like an infinite list of colors that are not damaged, so you get rid of the T factor entirely. There's like a bunch of like uh, disjunctions, you know. Oh, I see. Get rid of the T. I mean, I would not do that. Like, how, how, like, that would that be acceptable for like a, as a, would Goodman have acceptable or what? Well, that's basically the same. Well, I, first, I don't know why you need the other colors, but let's say it just was two colors. You say it, either, it means either green and examined or blue and not examined. That's basically the same as making T now. Uh, I, unless you mean like, or blue and will never be examined. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, maybe that would. Well, I guess the thing is that it's, you know, unlike all of those are crude, it's not entirely clear that, that we can't believe that conclusion. I mean, like if all animals are green, like we all expect that when time T comes, and you know, by the way, so people have been discussing this example for decades and time T keeps getting updated. <laughs> right? So the original time T is past. <laughs> right. So like we we, you know, I mean, we all expect that when time T comes um, and we examine more emeralds, they'll all still be green. You know. But what if so, so like we can't believe that you could you could collect evidence that they're green. I mean, like we I think you know, as Hume would say, like we literally can't believe. But does like the believability matter in this example? Well, maybe not. I mean Yeah, I'm not sure. But anyway, I mean, you see the difference, right? Like if I, if, if I say, now I'm not making a prediction about anything. If I say, by the way, all the emeralds that are never ever examined by anyone are blue and will always be blue, then, you know, uh, you might be tempted to say, well, that, you know, that's just metaphysics, right? We're talking about things that no one will ever know. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, um, you might be tempted to say, yeah, you might as well say that, but about emeralds that actually will be examined next year, no one wants to say that. Maybe, like, that's a way of like, circumventing the argument that we can't attach, like, a chemical uh, well, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary to circumvent that argument because I, I think this shows that that you know that to know whether something has a, a specific temporal point in it, you have to know what are the real natural qualities and what are not. Right? You can't tell by seeing whether it has a T written in it because Rue doesn't have a T written in it, and you can't tell whether it's a by the fact that it's equivalent to something with a T written into it, because green is equivalent to something with a T written into it. So you have to know already that green and blue are good predicates and blue isn't, to know that this one switches from one good predicate to another one at a certain time, and that one doesn't. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I think Goodman is right that for whatever, I mean, I, I don't know if Goodman would disagree that, you know, and we'll see uh, Popper emphasizing this, that like good, a good scientific hypothesis shouldn't mention a particular place in time. But um, but although that's true, that you know that has to come after knowing what concepts to put in and not before, because otherwise you can cook up these concepts that. Right. So I think that's the right answer to that. Anyway, as far as the thing about like, are there some concepts that are natural or real and others that are not? Um, Goodman's response to that is basically, well, that goes against my philosophical conscience, <laughs> right? Like that distinction itself is unacceptable. The idea that some properties are real, as opposed to just some things belong to some classes and other things belong to other classes, and you can divide it up however you want. Um, So, um, so the result is um, basically that that unless you can explain somehow why this predicate is not projectable and this one is, um, your whole the whole answer to the problem of induction doesn't really settle anything. It actually it turns out that. Um, we should allow anything to serve as evidence for anything, <laughs> right? Like whatever piece of evidence you have, this piece of rubber is bending. But by, by defining terms in weird ways, you can turn it into evidence of whatever hypothesis you want for the, for the future, right? Like it could, it, could, it could turn out to mean basically that all pieces of rubber examined so far bend, and that uh, all roses examined, you know, in the future will be blue. <laughs> or whatever you want. So, um, so it makes that solution to the problem of induction useless. Right, it's supposed to distinguish between the cases where we say, this is evidence, you know, this is a valid inductive inference. Like for example, this emerald is green, so probably all emeralds are green, with some slight probability, right? I mean, obviously you need more than one to build it up, but like it's supposed to distinguish between valid inferences and invalid inferences. Like this emerald is green, therefore all emeralds are blue, or something like that, right? But this shows that you know, unless we can keep out these bad predicates, and they're like as many bad predicates as there are good ones, as you can see from this example, right? It's not like there are weird isolated phenomena. So unless we can keep out these bad predicates, um, like there isn't going to be any kind of criterion we can get that will distinguish between the good predictions and bad predictions. Um, So Goodman's solution, <laughs> Goodman, so Goodman thinks that other people's attempts to solve this problem don't work. Um, I mean, either they literally don't work or they're inacceptable. So, uh, but he has a solution that he thinks will work, but it's something like it will work. Um, and so the solution depends on what you call um and crunch on. Um And the basic idea is 
in distinguishing between like we want to know whether a certain predicate is projectable or not we should use information about which predicates have actually been projected in the past <laughs> Um, so what does have been projected mean? Um, it means something like um we actually said <laughs> um you know after seeing a green emerald oh i bet all emeralds are green <laughs> or at least we thought i don't know i don't know but but it's but as goodman puts it it's overt and explicit projection Actual projection involves the overt, explicit formulation and adoption of a hypothesis. The actual prediction of the outcome of the examination of further cases. Right, that's important because it's have, like have actually been projected is not the same as we could have projected them if we wanted to. It means we actually projected, right? So it means that we actually decided based on a certain kind of evidence to adopt a certain hypothesis. And on the basis of that, make certain predictions. Um, so it's um, I mean, it's something a nominalist can believe in. It's, 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 it doesn't mention any unacceptable entities, like not, you know, like not actual possibles or anything like that. Um, it just talks about what actually, what people actually said and did. That's that's all we that's all we have we have to take into account here. Now, so how are we going to use that information? So, like. Of course, the simple way you might think of using that information would be to um, say something like, well, we've been successful with these predicates in the past, so it stands to reason we'll be successful with these predicates in the future. Right, so like you know, the the predicate green has actually been projected in the past, let's say, and I mean, most of these examples, like all emeralds are green or all ravens are black, like these aren't actually parts of anyone scientific theory. <laughs> I mean, there's never been never been scientific research to determine if all emeralds are green. I you know. There's, uh, there's there's something fishy about the examples, but anyway, let's just just ignoring that, you know. So like, um, um, yeah, we actually in the past have found green things, and you know, decided that all other things of that kind were probably green, and made predictions, and the predictions came out right. So green has a good track record, and we should go with drink with green. That's how you might think of using that um, information. But uh, Goodman says that's no really good because that itself is an inductive inference. Right? It's, you know, it's saying that like since the predicates we've used were good in the past, they probably will be good in the future. Um, and the whole question here is uh, um, how to tell whether an inference like that is valid. 
So we can't use one to answer the question. Because we don't know if it's valid. So it's question begging, basically. Right? I mean, it's just like. Um, it's really, it would be just like using a similar argument to try to answer the old question about induction. You know, like, why think that inductive inferences are valid at all? Well, they've always worked before, so, right? But, you know, again, that won't work because that itself relies on induction. Right, but the, 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 the things that have always worked before will probably work in the future is exactly what we're trying to understand why we think that or say that. So we can't use that. So that's not how he wants to use that information. How does he want to use that information? Um, well, first of all, so the way he talks about this is interesting and clever, but I'm not convinced that it's helpful. So he, you know, he points out that this projected is, you know, related to what we're interested in projected. This manifest predicate to dispositional predicates. To think that's true, you must think that projectable means something, it's like a prediction that we actually will predict, project hypotheses like this in the future. <laughs> um, uh, which I guess is right the way given the most of this issue. Right, like you might think projectable means that the justified projectable. So it's not at all like flexible, right? Like if rubber doesn't bend in the future, then rubber is not flexible. They're not always flexible. Um, but if you but you might think if people fail to project the right kind of hypothesis in the future, that just means they're not doing the right thing. It doesn't mean they weren't projecting. Right, just like in the case of a deductive inference, you know, like um, you might say, like from this and this, you can infer this or Q. And so you might say, like, all inferences of this form are deductible. Means something different in tax season, but anyway, <laughs> when I say like all inferences like this are deductible, then if it turned out that in the future someone you know wrote down premises of this form and didn't draw the conclusion, you wouldn't say, oh, it turned out it wasn't deductible. You would say it turned out they didn't do it. <laughs> you might think projectable was like that, but of course, you know, again, like. Goodman says, even about the rules of deduction, they actually, that what I just said was not exactly the right way of talking about it. That actually, the rules of deduction are justified by the fact that we accept them. <laughs> so, like, if we stop accepting them, they fail. <laughs> uh -huh. So, that's, what, that's how you have to understand projectable, also. Um, so that's not why I think that this way of finding it is not helpful. But the, the reason it seems like maybe it's not that helpful is that what he goes on to do is pretty different from what he does with flexible or whatever. Because so um, you know, so what you do with the projectable, with the um, dispositional predicates in general, again, is that you try to project the difference between manifest predicates out into the cases that haven't been examined. 
So you know, so you start with a distinction and then it manifests once, and then you try to figure out how to project it out here. But um, um, what he does with projectable is that I think I mean I may be missing something here. Probably smarter than I am, so I'm probably missing something here. But <laughs> all I can say is what I understand. So, like, I think that uh, the basic strategy in the case of projectable is to start off assuming that all hypotheses are projectable. Um, and then, um, Try to find a way to get rid of conflicts. Right? So, conflicting hypotheses are like, for example, models are green. Models are green. Um, these are conflicting hypotheses that have the same evidence before time t, or the same purported evidence before time t. So we start off assuming that they're both projectable, but then, of course, the problem is that there are all these, are these conflicting hypotheses that are both projectable. So depending on how you look at it, we have evidence for everything, or we don't have evidence, we have evidence for nothing. But anyway, we always have evidence for things that conflict with each other. So, um, um, so Goodman says, really, our problem here in, in terms of like defining projectable, that is um, narrowing down the hypotheses that we're going to allow you to collect evidence for and separating them from the others that we won't. Really, the problem with defining projectable is to get rid of these conflicts. Now, I mean, we don't have to get rid of all of the conflicts. Right? I mean, sometimes, like even the way we normally think of it, there's evidence that could support one hypothesis, and it could also support another conflicting hypothesis. And then we say, oh, we need a crucial experiment. I mean, crucial means, I think this is uh, Bacon's termination of it. Crucial means that it's like a crossroads, right? That like yeah, it seems like this be a whole cross, but anyway. But it's like an experiment where up until now all the evidence supports both hypotheses, but you find one that only supports one and not the other, and you do that. And right. So I mean, so it happens in normal inductive inference that there are conflicting hypotheses that are both supported by the same evidence. We don't need to get rid of all of them. But we do need to get rid of the um, fact that they're everywhere, <laughs> right? That is, we have to get rid of the problem that every piece of evidence supports everything or nothing because it's always conflicting. So we just have to we just have to trim them way back. And the way we trim them way back. Goodman says is that whenever there's two conflicting hypotheses, if one of them uses predicates that are more entrenched than the other one, um, then we allow the one that has the more entrenched predicates and we don't allow the other one. And what does entrenched mean? mean so this is where we're going to use the information about what's happened in the past. Entrenched means we have projected that predicate in the past. More entrenched means we projected it more often. So, right, so when we're trying to decide between these two, we say, you know, okay, like according to all the definition of induction so far, they're both supported by the evidence that the emeralds we've found so far are green. They're conflicting. I mean, meaning that they're also the emeralds we've found so far are also blue, right? Because again, before time t, everything that's green is definitely blue. 
everything you examine the port type Z is planted to green is definitely green. So, you know, so these are both supported by the exact same evidence as far as, you know, everything we know before we do this. And then, so we say, oh, so they're conflicting. Let's look at their presence. And we find that in the past, we've projected lots of hypotheses using the predicate blue, and few or none using the predicate blue. In this case, I think it would be none, <laughs> right? So we say, oh, green is much better entrenched than blue. Now again, this, you know, so this doesn't mean, this doesn't involve some kind of knowledge of the nature of universals and the essences of things or anything like that, right? All we have to know is what, like, things we've said in the past. Oh yeah, I think that we will find that all five agree. Anyway, so but actually it, it does it, in fact it doesn't matter if we were right or that's important. Right? It's just like the fact that we guessed on the basis of inductive and inductive different inference that, that all of a certain kind of thing were green, even if you turned out to be wrong. It still, it still shows that green is entrenched. So since green is entrenched and blue is not entrenched, we cross this one. And Goodman thinks or hopes that this process will result in cross, I mean, it certainly gets rid of blue right away. He thinks or hopes that this process will, will result in crossing out enough hypotheses that the ones that are left can be treated as normal conflicting inductive hypotheses to be settled by a crucial experiment. Now, um, Obviously, uh, this, I mean, okay, so I guess I could say it's first of all unsatisfying in the way that everything Google is saying about induction is unsatisfying, right? I mean, if you ask, but, but, like, Why should I believe that all I want to agree and not true? That is, you know, how can I know that the elements I dig up tomorrow will be green and not blue, or after time t will be green and not blue? So, like Goodman said, you can't know that. That's about the future. <laughs> you only know about the past and the present. You don't know about the future. <laughs> so, Oh, so like um, this doesn't do anything to, to like to make that better. If anything, it makes it worse, right? It's just like you know, why do I say all I know is green and not all I know is blue? Because because like I always say things are green. That's why I say they're green because I always think it's a group. Yeah. It's kind of weird because, like, I remember in the end of the third chapter, he's like, you know, if you're satisfied with the way science is going right now, you know, and you don't think you need to provide a theory for it, then don't do philosophy of science. He's out here, like, kind of doing this, it's kind of like relying on whatever science has previously done, you know, not trying to provide his own theory. Seems a bit of a critical thing. Well, I'm not sure. Wait, what are you thinking about the end of chapter three? Yeah, chapter three. I remember that, I don't know what's the case now, we did the section where he's kind of like critiquing people who don't really, who uh, don't really provide the answer to your problem with induction, you know? Um, or was this in section four that I didn't assign this year? Maybe that's what I don't remember. It's the end of chapter three, I think. Was the end of, oh, the end of chapter three. Oh. I, I'm going to find it later.
Um, well, I don't remember it that way, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about that, but no, I, I mean, um, I think his whole procedure, like Carnap's whole procedure, assumes that the way we're doing things now is basically okay. In science, at least. Right, that was what I pointed out at the very beginning that, wait, what, where is it? It's just like that middle paragraph right there. And that's how that's all I read. Um, okay, oh, I see what you mean. If our definition works for such hypotheses as are normally employed, isn't that all we need? Well, so I mean, he says, in a sense, yes. <laughs> so, um, Yeah, so the difference is subtle between what he's criticizing and what he's doing. But what he's criticizing is saying, well, um, uh, no one ever proposes hypotheses like these, so I don't have to think about that. What he's doing is saying, well, uh, no one has proposed such hypotheses in the past, but I propose it now. Um, now we have to think about it. What do we do with it? And the answer is um, um, we use the fact that no one has processed for that process in the past in the past to explain what's wrong with this one. Right? So rather than ignoring it, um He's uh, deliberately suppressing. <laughs> That's the difference. That's the difference between what we do about a hypothesis like this in science in everyday life, namely that it never occurs to us, and what we do about it within the philosophy of knowledge, as he puts it, namely that. Um, we have to see like what resources we have to limit it. And it's true that, and I think it's like, it's true, and I think it's a little bit tricky. I don't think it's ever critical, but I think it's a little bit tricky that when he says that at that point in chapter three, you think that the resources we have to eliminate are going to somehow, you know, um, uh, come from like extra stuff that the scientists and ordinary life people don't know. <laughs> um, that you know that we're going to we're going to tell and then tell you something secret about Guru that's going to tell you how to get rid of this. But it turns out that no, all we actually have uh, about this to do this is the description of what those science and ordinary life people have done so far. Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's a really good question. I think that's the right answer to it, but uh, but it's certainly you know bears further thought what he's doing now. Um, okay, how much time do I have left now? Oh, basically none. Well, so I mean. But you know, I kind of like answering that question. I kind of touched on what I was going to talk about at the end anyway, which is that you know, there's something inherently conservative about this approach. 
I mean, it does allow new predicates, as Goodman points out. And he says, he even gives a political slash economic metaphor for that. He says, just as entrenched capital must allow for free enterprise. <laughs> Right, so this entrenchment is, is apparently is he's taking it to be an economic term, a political term. And I think what he's thinking, and you know, this is also so I don't think he's thinking of like creative destruction, like free enterprise unentrenching the entrenched capital. He doesn't talk about a way that credits that were entrenched and become unentrenched. I think he means that, like, you know. General Motors and AT and T and IBM and whatever are like entrenched and they can't be dislodged, which is like what people a lot of people thought in this time period. It was and one people one reason people thought that so-called capitalism and so-called socialism were both converging at one system of like big bureaucratic control. <laughs> right, and so what he means in allowing free enterprise is that yeah, like new businesses can come up to exploit new opportunities that no one has so far. And that and, and that's what happens with the predicates too. New predicates come in, like he gives the example of conducts electricity. Like it's like something that people just didn't talk about before. So a new predicate can get entrenched. But the old predicates are like are entrenched, they're stuck. <laughs> Um, all right, that's all I have time to say, so I will see you next week.